billion dollars, give or take a few uh, billion uh, in federal debt. And that's a lot. That, that could be handled if you had the right policies, could be reduced. But what people don't understand is that the latest figures show we are now topping $13 trillion in family debt. This just keeps growing. Because people who are not making enough money in their Obama jobs, their, their short-term, part-time, temporary, low-wage jobs, are borrowing money to live. They're using credit cards to pay for medical expenses, credit cards to pay for food, for children's clothes, for school. And that's unsustainable. Uh, people are unable to make the, the home payments. There's a, a report that I think it's close to 50% of the American people couldn't come up with $500 if they had an emergency without going to a credit card. And of course, credit card debt is one of the most expensive forms of debt. So that that's the family debt. And included in that is student debt, which there's growing problems with people who are defaulting on that, auto loans and so on. And then there's corporate debt. Non-financial corporate debt is at record, record levels. And the only thing you can stack against that to say there's an economic recovery is the stock market. But the stock market is a bubble. It's not a sign of a recovery. And people are saying, well, it's confidence in Trump. Well, no, it's a con game. It's a Ponzi scheme that the banks have been getting free money from the Federal Reserve. They've been making it available to their blue chip clients and to themselves to buy stock. Banks are buying their own stock. And so you have the stock market appreciating at, at record levels. And you have this funny debate going on about whether or not it's a bubble. And people keep saying, well, if you think it's a bubble and you don't invest, then you're going to miss out on the opportunity of your life to make money. Sure, on paper, you'll be rich. And if you ever try and cash in on it, it collapses. So I think this debt problem is a fundamental weakness of the U.S. economy right now. But don't just focus on the government debt. We've got to look at the question of how do people dig their way out of something that's unsustainable. And then you look at the international situation, and the largest banks are increasing the amount of indebtedness. Uh, the, the estimates from the International Monetary Fund and the Bank for International Settlements are that there's no way that these debts will ever be paid. Uh, William White, the former chief economist of the BIS, just said that unless you have a write down of somewhere north of 60%, and I think he's being conservative in that, you're not going to be able to slage of European growth. And the European Union Central Bank announced this week there will be no banking separation, no Glass-Steagall, none of the sort that's now written into the constitution of the European Central Bank. And secondly, they just approved all forms of derivative transactions, the clearing houses, the uh, building up of uh, leverage, using leverage to purchase and buy and sell derivatives with no regulations on them. And that's, that, that's walking blindly off a cliff. And you know, it's very interesting. I mean, we're, we're talking about debt and household debt and global debt. And it's funny because the corporate media comes out and they tell you, you know, oh, the economy is doing very well because we can see that more people are taking out student loans. More people are using their credit cards to go shopping. More people are taking out automobile loans. But this is not the funds that, you know, the people have in their savings account. They're borrowing all this money to do all of these things. And the central bankers use it as, you know, this is a good thing. This means the economy is doing well. But they say that this shows that people have confidence in the economy. They're borrowing with the intention to pay it back. So many people are borrowing money knowing they'll never pay it back. You know, at least during the, the housing bubble in the 2005 to 2008 period, people thought, well, I'm borrowing new money against the up up the uh, upgraded valuation of my house so i have something to back it up well that turned out to be a complete fraud because the valuations were fraudulent and they collapsed now people don't even have that hope you know the idea that maybe i'll get a better job that doesn't exist anymore and so it's in that context that we see some of these debates over the tax reform and things that are are useful and necessary but they miss the point which is that the banking system as a whole, as someone put it recently, is an accident waiting to happen. 
And once it starts, once you have a bad derivative uh, trade, you're going to have a domino effect that will wipe out trillions of dollars of this unsustainable debt, at which point every dollar any American has in savings is probably lost. The upgrading of your 401ks and pension funds based on the stock market bubble, that will be wiped out. And it will be in that kind of moment of shock that we'll see that people will say, hmm, I guess that was a bubble. And we've got to do something before that happens, because if that occurs, all bets are off. I mean, you're going to have a police state clamp down. You're going to have people run off to prison. You're going to have a National Guard or U.S. military in the streets. You're not going to have food on the shelves. We've got to do something before that. Now, in that context, we saw something very useful this last week with President Trump's trip to Asia, trying to put the United States in a new situation on trade and on relations with our Asian partners. But you'd never know that to read the U.S. media. No, you, you wouldn't know that at all. I mean, the, the U.S. media was doing a terrible job in reporting. Of course, they didn't want to report it at all because they didn't want to let the word out that this is actually happening. Now, from your research and from the information that you have, we understand that, you know, Trump met with Xi Jinping and they were making deals out in China. And from what you saw, um, were there any deals that were made for trade? Um, is there anything that Trump is doing right now to help out with the economy moving forward? Well, there are two things. The, the first thing is that having a shift away from the Asia pivot of Obama is a great accomplishment. You know, the, the media, which is trying to say Trump is incompetent, he can't make a deal, he's, he's an imbecile, he's erratic. You know, these are people who praised Obama, whose idea of trade with Asia was to exclude China from a free trade agreement. Now, the free trade agreement was flawed to begin with. But how do you say you're going to increase trade with Asia when you exclude our major trade partner and the first or second largest economy of the world? So the, the Obama strategy, the Asia pivot, was to use military confrontation and challenge to China as a way to try and keep China under control, with the theory that China's aggressive, China's imperial, uh, aspirations will drive them to war. Now, what Trump said, and this is what the Chinese liked, Trump said, why can't we be partners? Why can't we work out trade deals? In China, he made a very clear statement, unlike during his campaign when he was saying that China was treating us unfairly. He said, look, in China, he said, it's our fault. We signed these deals. We worked the free trade agreements that allowed the Chinese to build up hundreds of billions of dollars of trade surplus with us. And he said, and this I found really fascinating, his, his toast to Xi Jinping, he said, I would have done the same thing if I were you because you took advantage of our stupidity. Now, if we work together, we can both grow. And this is Trump expressing agreement with the win-win approach that the Chinese are taking. Now, there were some deals. There was an initial one that, that already has happened, $9 billion, which includes agricultural goods, soybeans, and, and some machinery. There's another $252 billion of potential deals and these have to go through a process. But there were a number of American firms that were there, including aerospace, um, machine tool, agricultural equipment. They came back happy. We already have seen new jobs in West Virginia and Montana on a coal deal, discussion going on in Alaska on uh, energy. So there's a lot that was put on the table. But the most important thing is the break with the old system. And if you read closely in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Financial Times, you see this is what they don't like about Trump. Not that he's going to be manipulated by Xi Jinping uh, or anything of the sort. It's that he's not playing by the old rules. He's rejected them. He's broken with the unilateral globalist strategy. And he sort of adopted the Chinese strategy, which is that we need global trade. We need open and fair trade but we're going to make sure it's mutually beneficial. Now, if this can be followed through, what it means is that some of these American firms that were in China will be given an opportunity to bid on the projects in the Belt and Road, 
the, the New Silk Road program. Uh, this will include American firms that have no jobs here anymore, like nuclear uh, power plants. Uh, the Chinese want to construct a lot of them. Uh, it also includes uh, a lot of construction activity. Trump is a builder. He was very impressed by what he saw in China in terms of the modernization of infrastructure and so on. Now, it also means the Chinese who made this offer previously have now been invited to come in the United States with some of their money and invest it in U.S. infrastructure. And what would they do if they did that? They would be taking U.S. Treasury bonds and dollars from trade agreements or, or trade uh, that they've already made, uh, export money. They would put it in an investment bank, an infrastructure investment bank, to invest it in America. That's the Hamiltonian credit idea that Mr. LaRouche has put forward. It was what Alexander Hamilton did to build our country in the first place. So Trump is not going by the seat of his pants or some wild, esoteric or airy-fairy idea. He has a certain sense of you need to build something, you need to produce something. Now, we've lost that in this country. Under Obama, we not only didn't build anything, we took everything apart. That's been going on for 16 years at an accelerating rate. And that's why we have so much debt. So I think if people actually look at what was said and what was done, as opposed to what the U.S. media is saying, you'll see a very different picture. Well, since Trump has been out in China and he got rid of the TPP because that was going up against the One Belt, One Road, and that really doesn't exist. I know there's a couple of countries that are trying to get together and, and form the TPP without the United States. Is there any indication that the United States will be joining the One Belt, One Road trade system? Well, that's that's the big question. Uh, you know, you have a certain grouping of people in the administration of the neocon persuasion, maybe not as, as strong as under Bush and Obama, but you still have them there. People like Mnuchin, Gary Cohn, the Goldman boys. Uh, but as, a, as I said, Trump likes the idea of building. And what's the biggest building project in the world right now? It's the One Belt, One Road. There's an enormous amount of credit being invested by China in high-speed rail in Africa. They're now involved in discussions in the Middle East, uh, South Asia in particular, Malaysia, Thailand. They're, they're doing enormous amounts of, of contracts and deals. Eastern Europe, this is really fascinating. Uh, Serbia is bidding to become a transshipment center on the Belt and Road, which would be linked with the port of Piraeus in Greece, which the Chinese are investing in. The Italians are trying to get money for their southern ports, which have never been developed. You have in Eastern Europe, in Poland, and even Ukraine, they're bidding for the Chinese to come in. And in Germany, where I live now, uh, the government is totally opposed to the Belt and Road. They don't want China at all in Germany. And yet local businesses are saying to the federal government of Germany, get out of the way. We want these contracts. We want these deals. And so I think the Belt and Road is, as, as Helga LaRouche said, and she's one of the experts on this, this is an unstoppable momentum. And Trump can see that. And he has a certain personal relationship with Xi Jinping. Again, this was belittled by the, the media. The Financial Times said the Chinese are laughing behind Trump's back. Well, in fact, they gave him the greatest honor that has been given to a foreign leader since the communist revolution in 1949. They brought him to the Forbidden Palace and had a full state dinner in the inner sanctum. And this had never happened since 1949. Uh, and Xi Jinping went out of his way to praise Trump for his honesty and his, his commitment. So will we join the Belt and Road? That's still not decided. But I think there are a lot of American CEOs and, and medium and small construction companies and other firms that are looking at the opportunity, whether it's to build things in Kazakhstan or Siberia or to build them in Austin, Texas and Sacramento, California. They're hopeful 
that there will be contracts that will be forthcoming. Now, the establishment, the the deep state, the cabal, they they see all this happening right now. Are, are they going to let this happen, or are they going to try to do something to, to stop this? Because they didn't want this to happen in the first place. Well, this is what Russiagate is about. The whole idea from the beginning was that Trump ran a campaign first against the Bush Republicans, the establishment Republicans, the Wall Street Republicans, and he crushed them because the American people were sick and tired of these arrogant bastards telling them that they're stupid and and unemployable and deplorables and they can't work. So Trump smashed the Republican establishment, and then he smashed Hillary Clinton. And this whole discussion about who got more votes is is a red herring. Uh, Trump won the Electoral College. That's how we elect presidents. And how did he do it? He said to the American people, I don't like these elites either. And we're going to change the system. We're going to get out of this free trade agreement, this permanent war policy, this bailout and bail in policy. You know, he spoke about Glass-Steagall during the campaign, ending regime change, working with the Russians against terrorism. And people like that. Now, the problem is that this sent up, set up warning signals in London as early as the spring of 2015. And that's when the British started moving to try and get something going in the United States against Trump. And who ultimately did it? It was Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, with her own campaign funds, hired Fusion GPS, an opposition research firm, which hired a British ex-MI6 operative, Christopher Steele, to write a sexual fantasy series of memos uh, claiming that Trump is, is subject to blackmail by Vladimir Putin. And this was leaked to the media, which didn't run with it during the campaign, but they all knew about it. And there were innuendos everywhere. And then the FBI used this to get FISA warrants to spy on people like Manafort and other campaign officials. Who did they target? I mean, besides Trump, they targeted Michael Flynn. What was Michael Flynn's big crime? That he got some money from the Turkish government and didn't report it? No. His biggest crime was he blew the whistle on U.S. support of al-Qaeda and ISIS. Obama and John Brennan, the ex-CIA director, running arms to terrorists in Syria and Iraq. Michael Flynn, who was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Michael Flynn, put reports out on this, and Obama fired him. So he went to Trump. The fact that he got money to to give an address in, in Moscow, if that's a crime, why hasn't Bill Clinton been thrown in prison? So all this Russiagate stuff is a lot of huffing and puffing to stop a fundamental change that Trump was promising, which is a break with the old geopolitics. And so what do we see when he goes to to China? Uh, On the one hand, you have the Israelis and the Saudis forming an alliance to start a new war in Lebanon and to expand that into a war against Iran. Why will the Saudis do it? Because they just got their rear ends kicked with ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria. The Israelis are just crazy. They'll, They'll do anything for a war at least the Netanyahu faction. So this was triggered to try and disrupt things. And then, of course, you had the Mueller indictments, the first round, and you have rumors of another round coming up. Uh, And then the, the media trying to diminish the accomplishments of Trump on this trip. And the problem, Dave, the biggest problem, and now I'm talking to your listeners, not you, because I know you know this, too many people bought into this idea that, well, Trump sold out, Trump is finished, he was taken over, he was compromised. Look, the problem is Trump may not be the best person to do the job, but he's tough and he he has a certain inkling of what he wants to do. And instead of sitting back saying, see, I told you the deep state is too powerful, we should be revving up a mobilization to push this all the way, to take on the big banks, take on the Federal Reserve, move ahead with Glass-Steagall, and and also move for indictments of the FBI, Comey, who lied before the Congress, Clapper, who lied before the Congress, Brennan, who's probably an agent of uh, radical Islamic forces uh, from Saudi Arabia. Put these people on trial. Put a spotlight on this corruption. 
and and realize that the whole Russia Gate, the whole anti-China stuff, is an attempt to prevent the United States from breaking out of the control of this financial oligarchy, which is looting the American people, looting our treasury, and putting us in endless unwinnable wars. And you can see that the battle is being fought right in front of us. I mean, there's information coming out about Hillary Clinton and the Uranium One deal. McCain knew about it. And the whole Fusion GPS, which you mentioned before, all came out. And also we're seeing all the sexual scandals throughout Hollywood. Now it's hitting D.C. And we're starting to... Al Franken is the latest. Yes. Uh, You know, this, you know, you get us... I hate to get pleasure out of someone doing things that demean women. But it's good that people who are doing these kinds of things are now coming into focus. And you know, you're right. The, the people who have run this country for so long have an arrogance that they can get away with it. It's like the old divine right of kings. If you're a king, you can go and rape all the peasant women. Well, you know, hopefully this is, is part of the change, that we're not going to allow people to treat others as, as dirt just because they have some money and some power. And I think this really shows that ultimately the truth will come out, but you have to fight for it. You know, whether you're, you're looking into pedophiles in high places or just merely gropers. I mean, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bill Clinton. You know, people kind of chuckled at them as opposed to realizing that these are serious indications of disturbed minds. So I, I think that a lot of things are coming together. And why is that happening? Because I think people are starting to wake up. And and many people who, as we say, don't have $500 they could scrape together if they needed it for an emergency for a family health care or to fix a car, they're beginning to realize it may not be their fault, that there may be something wrong with the system as it works. And so what you're doing, Dave, what's being done with uh, a number of these uh, blogs and talk shows and, and alternative media is absolutely crucial. And we can see how crucial it is by the reaction against it. You know, YouTube censoring uh, people's programs. Now the Russia Today reporters in the United States have to file as foreign agents. And they're even talking now in the Congress about making Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, do the same thing. Whatever happened to freedom of the press? When the Russians do something against journalists, they raise holy hell. George Soros is out there with banners and reporters just going nuts. When it happens in this country, it's to protect our democracy from the evil, aggressive Chinese and Russians. That's absolutely right. And it's amazing that these countries where they where they have to register as foreign agents, they're going to file lawsuits against the U.S. government so they can speak freely and actually report on things freely. So other governments, other countries are fighting against censorship here in the United States where we have the Constitution, which tells us we're allowed. I mean, the whole thing's messed up. Well, it's it's one of these, it's the Alice in Wonderland world. You know, I, I found something Nigel Farage said the other day was quite interesting at the EU. He said, here we're having all this fuss. Now Theresa May is saying the Russians may have taken out some Facebook ads that affected Brexit. And Farage said, So there's $100,000 of ads on Facebook that no one ever read. How come no one's raising a fuss about George Soros putting $18 billion together to run regime change? And and that's where you begin to see the hypocrisy. But I I think it's hilarious that, you know, we're finding that uh, the, the United States is arguing that the Russians don't have freedom of the press as we're shutting down American press. And jailing journalists and, and jailing whistleblowers. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I, after the meeting with Xi Jinping with Trump, uh, we see that they're going to be sending a senior diplomat from China to North Korea now to have discussions. So was this part of the deal? Well, I think this has been in the works for a while. And, you know, Trump, again, people went crazy about Trump talking about how he wouldn't say that Kim Jong-un is short and fat. You know, this is a provocation. He's poking them in the eye. But look at the rest of his statement. He said, you know, maybe we still can become friends. Stranger things have happened. And there is a diplomatic channel. And it's not just China. It's also Russia and Japan. What's been overlooked is uh, Prime Minister Abe had a very productive relationship with or meeting with Trump 
And he praised Trump. He said, we've never had better relations between the U.S. and Japan. Don't look for that in the New York Times. It was in the Japanese uh, Shinbun Daily. Uh, the South Korean president, everyone said he and Trump won't get along. He praised Trump. He said Trump's speech in the South Korean National Congress was one of the best speeches ever delivered by anyone there. It was interrupted 20 times with applause. So we're seeing a, a kind of unity that's being pulled together. Now, it's very difficult because countries do have different national interests. But what's refreshing is Trump said, you should keep your national interests. Let's just figure out where our national interests coincide and work on those areas so we don't run into problems where there are differences. That's the basic principle that was adopted to end the 30 years religious war in Europe in the 1600s, the 1618, the 1648, 30 years war was ended by something called the Peace of Westphalia, where nations came together and said, we have to recognize that we should act for the benefit of the other. Now, who declared the era of Westphalia over? Tony Blair in 1999, where he put forward at a, a Chicago event, the idea of the responsibility to protect we, the great freedom-loving countries of Britain and the United States, have a responsibility to intervene wherever there's criminal activity, whenever there's not transparency, and so on. And that was the excuse for regime change. So Trump and Xi Jinping are going back to this earlier tradition, which has a, a lot to do with the intersection of Confucian thinking, the, the thinking of Confucius in China, being parallel to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, if, if you can wrap your mind around that and realize when Xi Jinping talks about socialism with Chinese characteristics, he's not talking about your old-fashioned Marxist German Democratic Republic or Warsaw Pact countries. He's talking about country that has a dynamic economic growth potential, which is lifting people out of poverty based on the best examples of, of Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition. And to, so, to show that this comes from China and Confucius is really quite interesting. So, you know, if, if you can elevate your thinking to get above the way that the current mainstream media tries to drag you through the gutter all the time, but actually think about what is the nature of man? You know, are, are we here merely to take care of our own creature comforts or do we have a higher purpose, our, our love of our family and children, the love of the nation with the desire to create a better future? To the extent that can be marshaled as a political force, it's an unstoppable dynamic. That's what the American Revolution was about. That's what Lincoln wanted to do with Reconstruction. That's what John Kennedy's idea was when he was prepared to take on the Federal Reserve and and use tax policy to create jobs and, and investment in new physical plant and equipment. So if we can marshal that spirit, especially if we can do it in conjunction with trading partners, it's an unstoppable dynamic. And, and I think that's what the American people should look to and put aside all this, this squawking of, of old geese in the media and, and realize that this is a dying system they're defending. Yeah, absolutely true. And I just want to touch upon what is happening out in the Middle East. And you mentioned uh, Lebanon and the so Saudi Arabia and Israel, where it looks like they're trying to push a war with Iran. But we also see uh, Russia and Syria, they are telling the United States to leave Syria right now. And the United States is trying to figure out a way to stay in Syria. And I shouldn't say it's the United States. It could be, you know, factions within the United States government where they're trying to stay inside of Syria. And and they really don't, uh, I mean, if you look at international law, they don't have a leg to stand on. And what happened? Yeah, because they, ha they weren't invited in. The Russians were invited in by a sovereign government. You know, right. I'm sorry to cut you off, Dave, but yeah. at the discussion with Putin and, and Trump, even though it was short, they signed this agreement, which accepts the independence, the sovereignty, and the territorial integrity of Syria. That goes against the Obama doctrine, which is to divide the country up. So what we're seeing now is that the Russians have a very strong standing, including with Jordan. There were meetings in Amman, Jordan, ongoing meetings between U.S., Russian, and Jordanian military uh, to discuss this. 
The Syrians are now meeting with the, the, their Turkish counterparts. We're seeing the Iranians uh, are involved in this. And then you have the neocons saying, well, Iran is building permanent bases inside Syria. These are the same people who said that Assad was using chemical weapons against his people without any evidence or that the Russians shot down the Malaysian jetliner. You know, there's so much fake news and lying and, and, and so on. But the key thing in the Middle East is that you have two governments that owe their existence to British intelligence at the beginning of the 20th century. Just a, a week ago was the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Now, this was the commitment to establish a state of Israel. I can tell you from having studied this extensively, there was no clamor among Eastern European Jews or European Jews generally to move to Tel Aviv or to move to Israel, which was under Ottoman domination. This was Lord Rothschild working with the highest levels of British, the, the British government, British imperialists, planning the carving up of the Middle East so that it would be, be a permanent area of British influence. Same way that the Saud dynasty was brought in by British intelligence, H.A.R. Philby, and the, the uh, Cairo Bureau, Arab Bureau of, of the British. So you had these two governments set up that were designed for permanent warfare. In Israel, you have this greater Israel faction, which is the so-called right wing or the Jabotinskyites. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, you have the hardcore Muslim uh, Wahhabite extremists. And you know the idea that Salman bin Muhammad or Muhammad bin Salman is going to moderate Islam when he's currently bombing the hell out of Yemen and continuing to support terrorists throughout the world is a joke. And I think the one problem we have in the Middle East is that Trump has a vulnerability there. And it may be because of his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Uh, it may be just that he has too many people who are part of the uh, American-Israel uh, Political Action Committee or Public Affairs Committee, APAC, that are talking in his ear. Uh, but we've got to solve this problem. And the way to solve it is to tell the Israelis and the Saudis to cut this out. You're not going to get any more aid, any more support. And the example of Lebanon, you know, here's a case where a government was working. You had Hezbollah there in the government with the Sunni group represented by Hariri. And then the president of Lebanon is General Michel Aoun, who's a Christian. And things were going along pretty well until the Saudis called Hariri out, told him he was about to get assassinated. And then the Israelis, the Israeli foreign minister or ministry sent out a document to every Israeli office around the world telling them to support what the Saudis are saying about Lebanon and Iran. So it's another orchestrated war. Are we going to let this thing happen again? I, I sure hope not. Yeah, I hope not either, because it looks like this is what they're trying to push for. Because they, I mean, from my point of view, it looks like they need some type of an event or something to stop what has been happening here. Because if, I mean, if, I mean, if the United States leaves Syria, I mean, Iraq also wants the United States to, leave, you know, they want them out. I mean, they're going to start trading outside of the dollar. I mean, they're going to sell their oil not using the petrodollar anymore. And it's already starting. Yeah, especially if the Federal Reserve keeps debasing the dollar. Right, right. And I mean, if this happens, I mean, if, if the United States leaves all these countries and, and allows these countries, which they were trying to do before we invaded and had regime change, I mean, that really is the end of the petrodollar at that point. Well, and not only the petrodollar, you're striking terror at the heart of the city of London and Wall Street, because this is the underpinning of that. That, uh, the petrodollar plus the international drug and gun trade. That's right. the, the main prop up of Wall Street and London. And then on top of that, you have all the speculative interests. But a lot of these, you know, if you go back and look at Michael Milken and junk bonds, he was basically bringing in international drug trafficking money to be able to purchase the junk bonds to give liquidity for takeovers. So there's nothing new in this. This goes back to the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank and the two opium wars in China in the mid 19th century. So there are ways to deal with these things. I think the best thing would be for the United States and the Russians to have a collaborative stance in the Middle East against terrorism and in support of nation states. 
Yeah, there are problems with the nation states. So you have the Kurds, you have Maronite Christians, you have Alawites, you have all these different groups. But they were actually functioning fairly well before the United States got involved with the uh, Brzezinski plan to use Islamic fundamentalism against the Soviet Union. So I think that there are ways to deal with these things. But the starting point has to be no more neocons, no more neoliberals. We've got to get back to the American economic system and a diplomacy which is based on this idea of acting for the mutual benefit or the fair trade agreements. And if Trump will do that and stick with it, he has the potential to be a great transformative president. Uh, if he's brought down by these scandals and these, these Mueller, the, the, who's a total fraud, if that happens, then there may not be much hope for the United States. Where is the United States, the, you know, the economy going from this point on? I mean, can everything be stopped? I mean, we talked about the debt. We talked about what was going on around the world. And do you see any possibility that this can be reversed at this time? Or does it have to just crash and be restarted? Well, it can be re reversed. I mean, right now, when you ask where it's going, uh, Hollywood and, and uh, uh, IT technology, especially cell phones, that's, that's the main future for America. That hmm. plus financial innovation, that is speculation. Now, if Hollywood self-destructs over the sex scandals, and people suddenly decide it's it's not worth a thousand dollars to have a cool phone that gives you a lot of bad in, information very quickly. Uh, you know, it, it may be people will say, well, what can we produce? And I think the areas where we can have an immediate effect would be in construction, high speed rail, uh, working on water management, upgrading the uh, protection of, of cities from. Uh, storms and things of that sort, but then also looking beyond that, uh, laser technologies, plasma technologies, there are all sorts of potentials where we, 20, 30 years ago, were spending a lot of money in research on these things that have been dropped. Uh, biotechnology, uh, allowing people to live longer and more healthy. So I think there's a lot of potential in the U.S. economy, but the financial system not only holds it back, but sabotages it. So we've got to get the financial system in shape, and it means we've got to deal with an out-of-control Federal Reserve, most importantly, the Federal Reserve of New York, because that's the enforcement agency for the too-big-to-fail banks. You deal with that and start with Glass-Steagall. Tell them they can't speculate anymore, and if they do, they're not going to get bailed out, and they're not going to be allowed to bail in. And if they try it, they're going to go to jail, and there'll be no bail. So I think if we did some things like that, we could turn it around. But, you know, it's a, a, a race to, you know, to the edge of the cliff. And we may go over the cliff before we end up doing the right thing. Harley, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Well, you know, I've had a, a great deal of fun communicating with your listeners by giving out my email. So I think I'll give that again if people want to be in touch with me. I'll send out a, a latest article I've written, and also I'm starting a blog, and I'll give you information on where you can go to regularly get my articles. But send me an email at harleysch at gmail.com. You know, I've received over 600 emails from your listeners, and wow. I've responded to all of them, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to see that people have that much commitment and passion. So again, it's Harley, S-C-H, H-A-R-L-E-Y-S-C-H, at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to send you something. Fantastic. Once again, thank you very much for being on the spotlight. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Dave. I always enjoy our talks. So do I.